to those that lay hold on it. See, it's not going to happen to you just because it's in the Bible. But it's through the righteousness which is of faith. Now, notice here that he says, The promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now come down to verse 16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Now that's the, the subject we're talking about tonight, calling things that are not as though they were. God taught Abraham to do this. This is a biblically sound principle of the Bible. Not only did God teach Abraham to do it, but Jesus operated in this principle in all of his ministry. Most people have never seen that. But Jesus operated in this in all of his ministry. He went to the, the marriage of Cana of Galilee. You know, and the way I caught a hold of this thing, I was, I was praying one day and I was reading the scriptures and I said, now Lord, if this, is this Mark eleven twenty three, 23 and these uh, calling things or not was a, a Bible principle, why didn't you operate it in your ministry? And for the next 15 minutes, I got embarrassed beyond measure because he took me through the scripture. See, you can know the Bible, but unless you look at it from a certain angle, you'll miss these things. And he took me scripture by scripture and showed me that almost every miracle of healing and manifestation of God's power that was wrought by Jesus Christ was by this principle. The marriage of Cana of Galilee. He told them, fill the water pots with water. You've got to be kidding. They're wanting wine, not water. Then he said, draw out now and bear to the governor of the feast. What was he doing? He's calling it wine. He's calling something that's not. Now, don't go get the garden hose and stick it in your gas tank. <laughs> that is not what he's talking about. <laughs> you know, you have to be careful about things like this. I was in Little Rock, Arkansas one night, and I was, I was sharing a testimony of how that I was flying out close to Big Piney, Wyoming one time in an airplane. It only held four hours and a half fuel. I flew five hours and 25 minutes. And I was lost. The radio quit working. And, and I was lost and was in the front out there. And, and when I landed, I'd been in the air five hours and 25 minutes. And when they filled the airplane up, it still had 17 gallons of gas in it. And the guy just shook his head. He said, they just burned more than that. Well, they always did before, but, and they always did after, but it didn't that time. Now, I told that in the church, you see, and, and there was a fellow sitting there in the church that got up after church service was over, and they went out and got in their car, and they started home. His wife said, we better get some gas. No, he said, uh, God put gas in Brother Cap's airplane, he'll put it in my car. <laughs> drove right by the gas station, and they were open, had the money in his pocket, drove five miles out in the country and run out of gas. <laughs> well, now, see, he called that faith. That wasn't faith, that's foolishness. But now you see why sometimes people criticize that because they say, oh, that's what they was teaching down there. No, that wasn't what I was teaching at all. He just misunderstood it, you see. That's not faith, that's foolishness, you see. I was in an emergency situation. And I'll tell you, God will do things. You see, if God had filled his car up with gas, what do you think would happen when, when, uh, when he wanted the oil change? He'd want God to change the oil <laughs> and over all the transmission. Well, God's not in the business of doing that. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So you have, to, you have to say some of these things. You might not ought to have to say it, but you do sometimes. But, but we need to understand that God's word is out there. Jesus operated in these principles of calling things that are not as though they were. Now, I wanted to mention a few of these things because it gets you to thinking in that direction because sometimes I get started into the, the, the other direction and I forget to come back to this. And this is vital to you understanding this and understanding that Jesus operated in it. You remember when Jesus in the synagogue one day, he, he, um, he had, there was a man there with a withered arm. And he said, stand up in the midst. And the old boy stood up. And he says, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or do evil? 
And of course, they didn't say anything. And I don't know, I just always saw this old boy's right hand just twisted like that. And he said uh, to the man with the withered hand, he said, stretch forth your hand. Now you know, I know, Jesus knew, and everyone in there knew that a crippled man with a crippled hand cannot stretch it forth. But a well man can. And the Bible says, and he stretched it forth, and it was whole as the other. What did he do? He called it well. And when the man acted on that, it was well. For him to begin to put it forth, he had to call it well. But for, for all these years, he knew he couldn't do it. Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda one day. There was a multitude of people there waiting for the troubling of the waters. And he, he walked up to this one man. And he said, Wilt thou be made whole? Now, see, sometimes we hear it said all kinds of ways. He didn't want to know if he wanted to be healed. He said, Will ye? There's a difference. Sometimes when I lay hands on people, I say, Will you be healed? And most of them will say, Well, I hope so. <laughs> or I know God's able. That's not the right answer. Will thou be made whole? 